Hello and thanks for joining us for today's video about arcade murders. We personally miss old arcades, even though you could probably play all those games for free on your laptop or even your mobile device. Do you have a favorite classic arcade game? Let us know in the comments section. Speaking of things that are readily available and free on your laptop and mobile devices, you should check out our other channel, Paranormally Listed. Three weeks ago we posted a video about strange tales from Hollywood. After that we posted our second video about cursed paintings. Then our third video is three horror movies that are based on real events. We'll have a link to those three videos and the Paranormally Listed at the end of this video. But before we get any further, we just want to talk about our amazing sponsor, Magellan TV. Did you know that Magellan TV has over 3,000 documentaries and 20 hours of new material is added every week? For its price and quality, I totally think that Magellan TV is a hidden gem when it comes to subscription services. You should check out Magellan TV for yourself, and when you do, I have a great two-part documentary you should watch. It's called How to Spot a Cult. It's a fascinating documentary that examines similarities between cults so you know what to look for. There are amazing and disturbing stories for former members. I personally thought this documentary series was really interesting because I had two friends who nearly joined cults. One of them almost handed over their life savings to the cult. What I thought was amazing was that these two friends seem unlikely to join cults, so it really showed me the power cults can have over people. So on a personal level, I highly recommend checking out this documentary. If you haven't already subscribed to Magellan TV, you should do it today, because they have a great deal for criminally listed viewers. Magellan TV is giving criminally listed viewers 30 days of free service. To get this amazing offer, just go to try.magellantv.com slash criminally listed. So please check out Magellan TV today because you'll find something great to watch and you'll be supporting Cribbly List in the process. Number 3. Tim Bell Tim Bell was a computer whiz who kept to himself. In 1985, the 19 year old attended the University of Miami for two semesters until he took time off school to make some money to buy a sports car. He worked at the Goldmine Arcades in Fort Myers, Florida where he had worked in high school. He was promoted to manager in October 1985. On the afternoon of October 28, 1985, Bell's dead body was found by his co-workers in the arcade's office. The 19-year-old had sustained 14 stab wounds to the neck and he was nearly decapitated. Many witnesses were questioned, but none of them saw or heard anything suspicious. The police suspected that robbery may have been the motive because cash was missing from the arcade. No arrests were made in the immediate aftermath of the murder. A year later, on August 27, 1986, Martha McAllister, a 38-year-old realtor, was showing a house in Long Point Key, Florida. The man she was showing the house to was David Hartlip, a 35-year-old Cape Coral resident. Around 6 p.m. that evening, David attacked McAllister as she sat in her car. He repeatedly stabbed her, dragged her body into some nearby woods, and then took off in her car. Two hours later, David used McAllister's credit cards to purchase food and drinks at nearby Holiday Inn. In another bold move, David treated his family to a Disney World and SeaWorld trip. He drove his family to these attractions in McAllister's Subaru and paid for it with her credit cards. David's wife, Sandy Hartlip, was unaware of the murder. He told her he got a new job as a shrimper and his boss loaned him the credit cards and the car. The couple had been married for four years and moved from Indiana a year and a half earlier. Days later, on September 2nd, 1986, a heated argument took place between the couple and David stormed out of the house. The police had been tracking David by the stolen credit card. He was arrested on September 19th. He was found driving Martha McAllister's car and her credit cards were in his possession. David was charged with murder. Sherry Cooper was a friend of the Harlips from Indiana. She lived with David's teenage stepdaughter, Trisha. Trisha was the daughter of David's wife, Sandy Harlip, and Sherry's current husband. Out of the blue, in 1987, Sherry came forward with information that helped with the 1985 murder of Tim Bell. Trisha, who was living with David at the time of the murder, told Sherry that he jumped Bell 
and stabbed him over the money. Trisha said that David stabbed the kid so bad that he almost cut his head off. She said he came home that day with a stack of wet money. When pressed about where he got the money, David said he got it at his shrimping job. David said that his boss threw the money overboard and whoever collected it first got to keep it. But David had been lying about being employed. Instead, he spent his days playing at the arcade. In August 1987, two years after the murder of Tim Bell, David Hartlip was finally charged with his murder. The news of the second murder shocked Sandy Hartlip, David's wife. When he was first arrested for McAllister's murder, she had trouble believing it. But after her husband was charged with Bell's murder, she gradually understood what her husband was capable of. And her story changed over time. She said in September 1986, he hit her. Then, in March 1987, he hit her a few more times. Then she remembers stories of David coming home, soaking wet, and spreading wet cash on their porch to dry. In November 1987, David pleaded no contest to the murder of Martha McAllister in exchange for a life sentence without the chance of parole for 25 years. But the prosecution had a problem with this. They had offered him a plea deal that he could plead guilty to McAllister's murder, but he also had to plead guilty to Bell's murder. They had his bloody fingerprint that placed him at the arcade. This sentence was to run consecutively with the other sentence, so it would be 50 years before he could apply for parole. In May 1988, he agreed to plead guilty to the murder of Tim Bell. He was given another life sentence with a chance of parole after 25 years. Tim Bell's family accepted the plea bargain. Often, death sentences drag out for years, and the family wanted to end this as soon as possible. We've been living with this for three years now, George Bell, Tim's father said. Every time it comes up, my wife spends another night crying. I don't think she would have made it through the appeals process. David Hartlip is 72 years old at the time of this video. He is serving a sentence at the Sumter Correctional Institute in Bushnell, Florida. He can apply for parole in 2037 when he will be 86 years old. Number 2. Susan Picarellio Susan Picarellio was the youngest of six children. In the spring of 1983, Susan was 16 years old and a sophomore at Walter Pananis High School in Corlin, New York. Susan disappeared on January 1st, 1984. She was last seen playing video games at the Games People Play Arcade in Lake Mohega, New York. Her disappearance was reported the next day. When she didn't return home, authorities initially thought she ran away. It wasn't until a note was posted on the arcade's back door that the police started searching for the teenager. The note reads, If you want to find the body of Sue P., go behind the game room near a small pond under window frames. The note was signed, The Killer. Two searches came up empty for Susan. Then, 17-year-old Raymond Cody started making unusual statements to the police. He went to the police station, claiming he was mugged in the wooded area where the police had searched. According to him, his pants were stolen in the mugging. On October 20, 1984, the police searched the area for a third time. During this search, they found a body under some leaves and broken window frames. Due to the level of decomposition, dental records were used to identify the body. It was the body of 16-year-old Susan Pecorellio. She had been struck on the back of the head with a rock. The police blamed poorly trained cadaver dogs for not finding her body earlier. The amount of time it took to find Susan's body was a sore point for her family. The police decided to interrogate Raymond Cody. He admitted to killing Susan, but he said it was an accident. He said they went behind the arcade to smoke marijuana. He claimed that Susan made sexual advances at him and he said no. She didn't listen, so he pushed her. 
She fell and hit her head on a rock. But Susan's blouse was ripped. So the police think that Susan rejected Cody's sexual advances and he snapped. As the police let Cody pass reporters after his arrest, he swore at them. Raymond Cody went to trial in July 1985. The jury deliberated over three days. They found him guilty of first degree manslaughter. He was sentenced to eight and a third years to 25 years of prison. He applied for parole after serving nine years. Susan's family was vehemently against his release. The family collected a thousand signatures petitioning against Cody's release. Despite minor infractions, Cody was considered a good prisoner by taking college courses and helping other inmates. He was ultimately denied parole. He applied for parole again in 1995. Cody continued to perform as a good inmate. Again, Susan's family fought for him to stay in prison. This time, they collected 5,000 signatures to keep him locked up. Cody was denied parole for a second time. He then tried for a third time in 1997. Once again, he was denied. He was paroled in August 2001 after serving 16 years. Since his release, Ray McCody has been a law-abiding citizen. At the time of this video, he is 55 years old and his current whereabouts are unknown. Number 1. The Malibu Grand Prix Murders The Malibu Grand Prix was a large amusement center in Houston, Texas. It featured go-kart tracks and an arcade area. On the morning of July 1st, 1983, an employee and a FedEx driver noticed the doors to the amusement center were open. They were shocked when they discovered the bodies of the four employees who were closing the night before. The victims were all repeatedly stabbed around the time the arcade closed at midnight. They were Anil Varaghese, an 18-year-old pre-medical freshman at Houston Baptist University and supervising manager that night. The second was Roddy Harris, a 22-year-old music student at Houston Baptist and church music director. He had just started working there the day before. And the other victims were brothers, 18-year-old Arno Paquino and 19-year-old Joreen Perquino from Houston. One of the victims was found in the office. The other three were found in the men's room, two in separate stalls, and another under a urinal. The police arrived on the scene. There was so much blood, they initially thought that the victims were shot. But stab wounds were found on the victims' arms, hands, and upper bodies, indicating that they were trying to fight off the killer or killers. Police noted no forced entry, but money was stolen and the safe was emptied. Employees were shocked by the murders. They did not think that the business made enough money to warrant such a horrific crime. The robbers reportedly took around $1,300 to $1,800. The investigators collected fingerprints and examined blood spray patterns that led to the parking lot. The police started by looking at formal disgruntled employees. Less than 12 hours after the discovery of the bodies, the police identified three suspects. One of them was 20-year-old Richard Wilkerson, who had previously worked at the arcade as an assistant manager, but had been fired two weeks prior. He was arrested along with his cousin, 16-year-old James Randall. Once in custody, Wilkerson gave the police a six-page statement that was eventually used to convict him. Another man, 20-year-old Kenneth Ransom, turned himself in under the advisement of his mother a few days later. On the night of the murders, Ransom and Randall took a four-inch butcher knife from Ransom's girlfriend. The pair met up with Wilkerson. Wilkerson grabbed a knife from his house and the group went to the amusement center just after closing. Once there, Wilkerson demanded the paycheck he was entitled to after he was fired from Varghese. Varghese told Wilkerson that he could get him his job back. But this caused Wilkerson to snap and he stabbed the 20 year old manager 42 times. He then emptied the safe. Randall and Ransom led the other employees into the restroom. 
They locked Roddy Harris and Doreen in two different stalls and stabbed them repeatedly. Arnold Aquino's body was found in the bathroom corner with his head under one of the urinals. Roddy Harris had been stabbed seven times. Doreen Paquino received 11 stab wounds and Arnold Paquino was killed with 21 stab wounds. Wilkerson's time card was found signed on the manager's desk. After the murders, the three killers went to Ransom's girlfriend's house. They were covered in blood. As they sorted through the stuff they had grabbed, Ransom's girlfriend noticed a driver's license belonging to Roddy Harris in the garbage can. Wilkerson and Randall spent the money on clothes hours after the murders. Ransom became visibly upset and decided to leave town. His girlfriend noticed that he was wearing a watch and a class ring he had never worn before. They belonged to Arnold Paquino. All three men were charged with capital murder. Richard Wilkerson went to trial first in January 1986. He was found guilty of capital murder. He was sentenced to death. James Randall, who was 16 at the time of the murders, went to trial in March 1984. Even though he was a juvenile at the time of the murders, he was tried as an adult. He was found guilty. But since he was a juvenile, he wasn't sentenced to death. Instead, he was sentenced to life with a chance of parole after 20 years. Kenneth Ransom was found guilty of murder in June 1984. He was also sentenced to death. Richard Wilkerson was executed on August 31st, 1993 by lethal injection. In his final statement, he said, I'd just like to say I don't hate nobody. What I did was wrong. I just hope everyone is satisfied with what's about to happen. He had served about nine years on death row and he was 29 when he was executed. 34-year-old Kenneth Ransom was executed on October 28, 1997. While strapped to the gurney, he spoke his final statement. First and foremost, I want to tell the victim's families I'm sorry. I'm not sorry because I feel like I'm guilty, but because of the pain they go through every holiday, the pain each birthday. He then went on to say, I feel like this is God's will. I feel like I'm the instrument in hopefully abolishing the death penalty forever. Ransom sang a Muslim prayer and smiled at his mother as the drugs entered his body. He was pronounced dead at 6.20 p.m. James Randall was paroled on January 18, 2019, more than 35 years after the murders. Thank you so much for watching today's video. Please don't forget to check out our new channel, Paranormally Listed. There's a link on the screen now, and there's a link in the description box below this video. Well, that's all for today. Thanks again for watching.